Persona 5 in general might be one of my favorite JRPGs of all time, so it was only natural that I wanted to do a challenge run of the game eventually. My biggest issue though was finding some kind of challenge that has yet to be attempted. If you look up YouTube, literally everything has been tried at this point. I just couldn't come up with any idea until it hit me out of nowhere one day. Guns only. Great idea, I thought. Let's give this one a shot. So, as always, let's go through the rules before we get going, because we actually have quite a few this time around. The difficulty we'll be playing on is hard. Hard, in my opinion, is harder than Merciless, no pun intended. We will be working with technical damage a lot, so Merciless would make this much easier, and we don't actually want that. Only gun type damage is allowed. This includes damage from the actual gun, all skills that are classified as gun attacks, as well as showtime attacks where the main focus is on guns during the animation. Now, I know that showtime attacks are technically considered almighty damage, but some of the animations fit the theme, and we need something to get passed by gun immunity, so we let this one count, especially since we ban all out attacks. Also, note that this rule won't come into play until after the Eligor boss fight, since you don't really have any opportunities to grind gun skills up to that point. Skills and items are allowed as long as they don't deal damage to the enemy. No repel cheesing, so no use of mirrors or the Tetrakarn and Makarakon skills. Both Network Fusion and DLC Persona are not allowed either. And as always, last but not least, no New Game Plus. Since most of you probably know pretty much every detail of the story at this point, I'll try to keep it to the relevant parts that are actually useful for the challenge and just skip out on the rest. With that being said, let's get right to it. We start the game, set the difficulty, go through the opening cutscenes, and get to name Choker with the appropriate name of Cold Magnum because... well, guns. We jump forward to April the 12th, where we enter the castle for the second time and first get access to the gun. At this point, we don't have any gun skills available yet, so we need to work with the couple of shots that we have. This actually works decently well for the most part. That is, until we run into Eligor. Ryuji awakens to his persona and we get the first actual boss fight. Unfortunately though, gun only in this one is pretty much impossible. Like I just mentioned, we don't have access to gun skills yet, and grinding isn't possible yet either. The bit of gun damage we do to Eligor is nowhere near enough since it also resists gun attacks. Because of that, we have no other choice but to finish the fight off casually once everybody got rid of all their bullets and continue on. From this moment on, we can technically grind enemies, so that means gun damage only from here on out. We return to the castle three days later on the 15th in order to rescue Odd. Now, again with Belphegor, we would have a similar issue as with Eligor earlier, where the gun damage is nowhere near enough to get us through the fight. Luckily, on the way to the safe room, you pass a room with three enemies in it. Those enemies just happen to respawn when you reload your save file. So, by beating the enemies, going back to the safe room, saving and reloading the file, we can make those enemies respawn. Now, you may ask, why is this useful? Well, it just so happens to be that Arsene learns Dream Needle on level 5, which is a gun skill and therefore allowed in this challenge. It took me about 30 minutes of grinding, which was honestly not as much as I first expected until Arsene hit level 5 and learned Dream Needle. With that skill in possession, we are off to rescue An. Just like with Ryuji, An awakens to her persona and we get into the next boss fight with everyone's favorite toilet demon, Belphegor. There isn't really much to say about this fight in general. Turn 1, everyone uses their gun bullets, which already got Belphegor close to half of his health. The following turns, Joker uses the newly learned Dream Needle, while Morgana and An keep the party alive by using Dia, and defending on turns where there is no healing needed. Only a couple of attacks later, Belphegor is already down and we're done in the castle for today. We meet Dr. Lax for the first time and use the money we've gotten so far in order to upgrade our equipment. Luckily grinding our sent to level 5 also gave us some money to work with so we can upgrade everyone's guns. 
Unfortunately, at this point, we don't really have any money left anymore, so we're back into the palace the next day to secure the treasure out. We go through the mandatory fusion tutorial, where we unfortunately have to sacrifice our Ascend without being able to register it first. Luckily, Agathion can inherit gun attacks, so we can carry over the Dream Needle from our Sen. Secunda is a nice bonus, but not really that important. Progressing through the palace is actually not that hard for the most part. Thanks to the upgraded guns, we can take out the majority of encounters within a single turn, unless it's something that resists gun damage like a Gaffeon. If something is still alive after the initial ambush, Choka usually finishes it off with a Dream Needle on turn 2. Once we hit level 7, we go back to the Velvet Room to fuse a Gembu in order to gain access to Rakunda, as well as carry over Dream Needle once again. With that, we continue making our way through the palace. The occasional sleep proc on Dream Needle is rather nice since sleep is one of the few status elements that lets you hit a technical with gun attacks. Anstor Mina's spell is very useful for that situation too. On level 8, we return to the Velvet Room yet again to fuse our Gembu into an Oberian. This one is important for two reasons. First of all, Oberian has access to the Snap skill from the get-go, which is a straight upgrade in terms of damage compared to Dream Needle. It is also the first Persona to be resistant to physical attacks, which is going to come in very handy for the Kamoshida boss fight. Before getting there though, we have to go through the mini-boss in Archangel first. This one was actually easier than I thought it would be. After debuffing his defense with Rakunda, the guns do a good amount of damage, and the charged attacks for the most part can be mitigated by guarding with the other party members. I did get a little bit unlucky towards the end when Snap missed twice in a row, but luckily Archangel's charged attack missed as well, and we were able to finish it off without further problems. The rest of the palace isn't really worth mentioning for the most part, as it's pretty much the same procedure as before. Throw out all gun attacks and finish off with Joker. Stronger encounters like Archangels or the two forced Eligor fights are easily mitigated with sleep spells and the technical hit from Snap afterwards. After securing the treasure route, I also decided to take a shot at the Gatekeeper of the Last Will Seed and Slime. This one is rather tough as it resists gun attacks, but again, we can put it to sleep in order to mitigate the incoming damage, as well as getting a technical hit on it. With the help of Tarukaja from Ryuji, as well as a Rakunda debuff, Choker actually did somewhat decent damage with Snap, and we were able to finish the mini boss off and grab the last Will Seed. The resulting Crystal of Lust accessory is pretty useful since it gives the owner access to Diorama. We put that onto Ryuji in order to have a healing spell on every party member. Before leaving the palace though, we grind the entire party to level 11. On level 11, Morgana learns Media and An learns Tarunda. Both are extremely useful skills that I really wanted to have available for the upcoming boss fight. With that being done, we leave the palace and send the calling card shortly afterwards. Kamoshida is not a fan of us trying to steal his crown, and the first actual big boss fight of the game starts. After debuffing Kamoshida and buffing Choker, we start dealing damage, but only with Choker in the beginning. Snap does a good amount of damage to Kamoshida, and the incoming damage is very manageable for the most part, with on debuffing and the party guarding and healing. After 4 turns, we already trigger the next phase of the fight, where we now have to get rid of the trophy to prevent Kamoshida from healing. Luckily, after putting Rakund on the trophy, 3 snaps are just enough to destroy it and advance the fight further. We guard the first spike, which surprisingly does much less damage than I thought it would, which triggers Shiho. In order to get rid of her, you can either beat her or deal 300 damage to Kamoshida. I decided to go with the latter since you can easily knock down Shio and use the baton pass to deal good amounts of damage to Kamoshida with snap afterwards. Once Shio is gone, you can try to knock off the crown off his head. This is actually where the problem started. With only Joker doing attacks, I wasn't able to deal the necessary amount of damage needed to advance and the party members got caught before they could do anything. I did try this three different times, twice with Ryuji and once with Morgana, but it failed every single time because I wasn't able to get the damage needed in in time. 
After three failed attempts, I just stopped trying, because at this point, Kamoshida was almost done anyways, so I decided to just normally continue on and finish the fight. Once the boss is down, we get our reward, get out of the palace, and are done with dungeon number one. Since we do have a bit of time to kill now before we're entering the next palace, we can do a couple of things. First of all, we're trying to get our social stats up quite a bit, especially Guts. Since our main focus is on guns, Awaii, the gun shop owner, is one of the most important confidants in this challenge. In order to get started with him though, you need Guts at rank 4, so we're reading books and watching DVDs to get those up. Ranking up Tai at the clinic also has a nice side effect that we're getting additional points in Guts as well, while also expanding the items we can buy there. We also start up ranking up our party members for the benefits in combat. Especially Ryuji is going to be very important since his rank 7 insta-kill ability will make grinding much more comfortable eventually. While we're trying to sell off the metal to UI, we also have to sneak out a bag for him which contains a gun that we're allowed to keep. This one gives Choker the ability to shock enemies which just so happens to trigger a technical hit when following up with a gun attack afterwards. Generally, gun ailments won't be possible until we get Y up to rank 3, so this is the only way we can apply shock for now. We also go out to eat and celebrate our victory, and get to name our group with the very fitting name of... Well, you can see it on the video, I don't think that needs further explanation. The party also goes down mementos for the first time, though there isn't much to do at this point yet other than completing the first request and meeting Chose on the way out. We also meet Maruki for the first time, who technically is one of only two required confidence we need to finish in order to get the true royal ending. Luckily, we got way more than enough time to do that. Also, of course, a playthrough of this game is not valid unless you button mash on Morgana. Shortly afterwards, we meet Yusuke and Madarame, and are basically getting started with palace number 2. The first visit doesn't really have anything worth mentioning for the most part. We make our way through the palace just like before. Unfortunately, Choka's level is still too low to get some of the better personas here, so we continue with Obarian for now. After a failed attempt to get Ana out of her clothes, they discover Madarame's secret. In the meantime, Choker and Ryuji continue on in the palace by themselves, with the next mini-boss Nui coming up. This one is pretty much a pushover. After applying Rakunda to the enemy and Taro Kaja onto Choker, the normal gun already takes off half of its total HP. Two snaps later, the fight is already over again. On and Yusuke both end up in the palace, Yusuke awakens to his persona and we're already off into the next battle, which is literally the only time Yusuke will ever get used. Again, we buff Choker and debuff the enemy. On puts one of the Kappa Tengus to sleep, so we can get a knockdown and a baton pass to Choker. Unfortunately, that didn't quite work out like I wanted to, but it wasn't really a big deal, because Choker just critted Ipon Datura and did big damage with Snap anyways. Once Ipon Datura is down, we clear up the remaining Kappa Tengus until the last one of them is down as well, and the fight is completed. Before we return to the palace though, we still spend a couple of days in the real world in order to get Ryuji's confident to rank 7. Like I mentioned earlier, this unlocks his insta-kill ability, which I thought to be very useful for grinding levels later on. Ryuji's rank 7 is also special in the sense of that it can only trigger during nighttime on certain dates, so I wanted to make sure to get him up high enough until then to be sure to get it in time. Once that is completed, we go back to the gun shop one more time to upgrade everyone's but Choker's weapons before finally returning back to Madarami's museum. Since we also just got to level 15, we fuse our Oberian into a Shisa, since it's the first persona with decent stats that can actually inherit gun skills. Oberian at this point was falling off rapidly, so this was actually pretty convenient timing. Progressing through the palace was rather difficult at times. There were several enemies on the way that straight up null gun damage like Inugami, Makami and also the Red Shadow Shikiuchi, so getting experience and money was difficult at times since we literally had no means of dealing damage here. Luckily in Royal, 
The mini boss here got changed from Shikiuchi to Kurama Tengu, who does not null or resist guns, so getting through this one luckily was not a big issue. Again, we are working with Ansh Mina Sleep skill in order to hit technicals on the mini boss, as well as getting an occasional baton pass when the enemy gets knocked down. Other than that, there isn't much worth mentioning here, and the enemies go down rather quickly. The rest of the dungeon was mostly the same, with the main issue being enemies that are gun immune becoming more and more of a problem, to where I had to run for more encounters than I could fight. This all became even worse though when we ran into the second mini boss, if you want to call it that way, that being three Makamis. Remember earlier when I said Makamis null gun damage? Those do too, and they are mandatory to fight. At this point, I actually thought the challenge was dead already. My way out of gun immunity was showtime attacks, which I haven't unlocked yet, so here I was standing thinking, there is no way of getting through this. Luckily, I did find a little loophole though. Remember, the rules said items are allowed as long as they don't deal damage, and I just so happened to have a couple of straw dolls in my inventory, which have a decent chance to instantly kill an enemy. Since those don't deal any actual damage, they are technically allowed judging by the run's rules. Now, I am very much aware that I am kinda stretching the rules here quite a bit, but at this point of the game, I literally had no other way to get through this fight. I wasn't very happy with the solution either, but since there was no other choice, we went with it in order to continue the run. Before we finish securing the treasure out though, I wanted to give the Will Seed Gatekeeper a shot. This version of our Habaki is actually not immune to gun damage, but does still resist it, meaning we barely do any damage. And to make things even worse, our Habaki likes to spam status ailments and follow those up with psychic attacks in order to hit technicals on the party. And while it is possible to put our Habaki to sleep, it's not really that good of an option considering the amount of HP it regenerates during sleep is often higher than the amount of damage I can inflict to it in a turn. Since I wanted to grind a couple of levels anyways, I decided to stop trying for our Habaki for now and come back later. Once Choker hits level 18, we're back to the Velvet Room in order to fuse a Shikiyuji. Not only does it have pretty good stats, it also fully nulls physical and gun attacks, and due to it being a Chariot Arcana, additionally also gets a big experience boost from Ryuji's Confident. And if that wasn't enough already, it also knows Double Shot from the start, which is another upgrade to our gun skill inventory. So all in all, a great upgrade. I was not fully done at this point though, as I decided to grind the party all the way to level 20. I wasn't sure how big of a problem Madarame might become, so I wanted to make sure to have a couple of levels, just in case things go wrong. I also gave our Habaki another shot, and after getting decimated two more times, I actually found a decent strategy to work with. Sleep wasn't really an option, so I went with Confusion from Morgana. This hit relatively consistent, and even though I couldn't hit a technical from that status, it worked well enough that we actually got our Habaki down, and the last will seed in order to obtain the Crystal of Vanity. This one actually erases the elemental weakness of the party member wearing it, so we put it on Morgana to make sure he can safely heal when needed, and not be afraid of getting hit by a weakness attack. Before sending the calling card, we go back to the clinic to stack up on healing items. I wasn't sure how hard Madarame was going to hit, so I wanted to make sure to have stuff available just in case. Once that is done, we set the calling card and are off for boss fight number 2 the next day. Madarame again comes in two phases. In phase 1, you need to take down all the different portrait parts. Luckily Shikiuchi knows Marakunda, so we can debuff the entire enemy within a single turn. Shikiuchi is also strong enough to take a piece out with a single attack, so it's more a matter of keeping the party alive than anything else. Unfortunately though, the mouth drains physical and gun attacks, so we can't damage it at the beginning. We make sure to take out all the other parts though when they are regenerating until the next part of the fight triggers. After several turns, you get the option to pour paint over Madarame, which makes him weak to literally everything in the game, including gun skills that it drained before. 
Once that happens, we can easily take out the remaining pieces with Shikiuchi and transition into phase 2. In this phase, Madarame summons a couple of copies into battle. Now, the game definitely expects you to make use of the elemental weaknesses here and deal damage via baton passes. Unfortunately, this is not an option for us, so we just completely ignore them and focus on Madarame himself. Luckily, the copies don't deal a lot of damage, and the party guarding the attacks also prevent a lot of potential weakness attacks. This is also where Morgana's new accessory from Orohabaki comes in real handy. He can heal when needed, without being afraid of getting hit by a weakness the following turn. Joker, in the meantime, continues dealing damage to Madarame with double shot. This is pretty much everything that is to that boss fight, and even though it took quite a while, Madarame went down eventually, and palace number 2 is completed. Back in the real world, we continue on our social stats and confidence in the meantime. We also get to Kichiyoji for the first time, which is going to be pretty important later on in order to raise our technical and baton pass ranks. With the amount of technical hits we are working with, getting the ranks and therefore damage up is a huge boost. Since we also racked up 4 requests in the meantime, we head back into mementos again. Thanks to Ryuchi's insta-kill ability, we can run over quite some enemies, which makes progressing a lot easier. We grab all the stamps on the way, and also complete the open quests that we have at this point. There honestly isn't much worth mentioning here for the most part. The strategy is pretty much the same every time. Buff debuff, put the enemies to sleep, and try to get technical and critical hits in. Once we're done with everything, the party is already level 24. We meet Pancake Kun for the first time. I thought I heard something about delicious pancakes. And raise our technical rank playing billiard to level 3. We also finally hit Guts rank 4, which lets us unlock the confident with Hawaii. Before being able to rank him up though, we already get into the next story part with Makoto's Awakening. The Onis you have to fight here are rather annoying since they resist gun attacks. But again, the combination of sleep plus technical hit is doing rather good damage, so we get through that fight without bigger issues. After Makoto awakens to her persona though, she replaces An in the following fight, which makes hitting a technical hit rather tricky since we don't have access to sleep anymore. The most important thing here is to take out the Fuki first. Mabufu actually hurts quite a bit, so we want to make sure to get rid of it quickly. Once that is done, the fight is basically free. The Onis only use physical attacks, which Shikiuchi nulls, so there is no way they can beat Joker at this point. The rest of the party can still go down rather easily, but that doesn't really matter at this point. With that being done, we could already complete the palace, but I wanted to make sure to get Iwai to rank 3 before that, in order to unlock gun customization. Having gun ailments on every party member is a huge upgrade, especially now that we ranked our technical rank up twice too. This means we should be dealing technical damage much more often and consistently. With those upgrades, we are off into palace number 3, Kaneshiro's Bank. In the very first fight, we also finally get our introduction to Showtime attacks. Like mentioned in the rules, even though those do almighty damage, we allow those where the animation focuses on guns. Luckily, the first one with Morgana and An perfectly fulfills those requirements, so this is our number one way to deal with gun immunity now. The dungeon again for the most part follows the same pattern as the previous ones. In the early part of the dungeon, there are pretty much no enemies with gun immunity, so progressing is rather smooth for the most part. Before we reach the basement, we run into another mini-boss. This time it's the combination of Fuki, Suiki and Kinki. Fuki and Suiki are no problem, but Kinki nulls gun attacks, so we need to force a Showtime trigger in order to damage it. One possible way to trigger Showtime attacks is hitting critical and technical hits, which pretty much perfectly falls into place since that is our main means of damage anyways. So as always, we hit technicals on the other two guys, but Tom pass over to Morgana or An, and hope for a showtime to occur. The first showtime attack does so much damage that it almost one-shots Kinki completely. After taking care of the other two enemies though, it becomes a bit of a problem. There is no way to baton pass anymore, and showtime events don't really seem to trigger randomly during a turn. 
Luckily, a showtime can also trigger when a party member faints and gets revived. So once King Key wipes Morgana, we bring him back and luckily get the showtime event trigger right afterwards to finish off the fight. We continue on to the basement where the palace becomes quite a bit harder. Almost every enemy formation at this point has at least one enemy with gun immunity in there, so we barely are able to beat any shadows at this point anymore. Luckily there aren't any mandatory fights with gun immunity though, so we can progress through the rest of the dungeon until we secure the treasure out. Before leaving though, once again, we still need to get to the last will seat, which is protected by Cerberus. Luckily this one is neutral to gun attacks, so again, sleep plus technical damage is our best friend. He does counter attacks every once in a while, which is annoying, but not really a big issue. At this point, we are pretty much done with the palace, but I still wanted to grind the party's level to 30. Level 30, On learns Lullaby, which is an AoE version of Dormina and can put all enemies to sleep. I also fused the Satanta and grinded that one to level 26. Satanta is the first persona in Royal to get access to charge, which greatly boosts our gun attacks and can become very useful. With all that out of the way, we can now send the calling card and get ready for big boss number 3, Kaneshiro. Kaneshiro unsurprisingly again comes in two phases. In phase 1, we have to beat the Piggytron. As always, we make sure to debuff the enemy and buff Choker in order to get through this. Charge is a huge help here as Double Shot takes away a third of his max HP after Choker has gotten fully buffed. Kaneshiro's special attack is actually not that big of a deal either. Even without throwing any items to prevent it, it only deals about 100 damage to each party member, as long as the buffs and debuffs are all up. Once Piggytron is down, the actual interesting part of the fight starts. Kaneshiro summons two guards and phase 2 begins. The strategy here is to put all enemies to sleep and then deal damage to Kaneshiro. The only problem is... Kaneshiro is immune to gun damage, which means we would have to bust out Showtime attacks again. No problem, or at least that's what I thought. We have seen earlier what kind of requirements need to be met in order to trigger a Showtime event. Unfortunately though, almost all of those triggers don't seem to be working on actual boss battles. I have seen Showtime attacks on bosses before, so I knew it was possible. I just didn't know how to trigger them and here is where the frustrating part started. No matter what I did, no matter what I tried, the showtime just never happened. I did hundreds of baton passes, I let all my party members die and brought them back again. Nothing worked. For two straight hours I attempted to force a showtime and didn't get the trigger one single time. At this point the hard truth set in slowly. There is no way to get through this boss fight with the rules that are set. The only actual working trigger to a showtime on a major boss fight is the one where the boss is already almost dead. Unfortunately, we never got to that part, so triggering that did not work either. Since we don't have access to Shinya's confident at this point yet, there is also no way to bypass his immunity with Choker's gun either. I did think about breaking the rules for this one fight and use freeze sprays in order to get the frozen status on him. Freezing bypasses gun immunity, so that would in theory work, but even if we get through this boss fight, we would run into the very same problem later on with phase 1 of the Shido boss fight. And unlike Kaneshiro, Shido is not vulnerable to freeze, so that wouldn't be an option then either. With that being said, this is where the run unfortunately ends. Once I took care of the bodyguards, I did get Kaneshiro down far enough with auto attacks to get him into kill range, and lo and behold, the showtime immediately triggered once he was that close, which just confirmed my suspicion that this is the only working showtime trigger on major boss fights. So yeah, that is it for this run unfortunately. Even though this challenge didn't finish, I am not done with this game yet as I already plan to start a new challenge run in the near future. I actually already have something in mind, so be sure to subscribe to the channel and also follow me on Twitch in order to see what's about to come up here soon. The links are also below in the video description. 
With that being said, that is it for me this time. Thank you very much for watching, take care, and I hope I see all of you next time as well.